I'm uh, Joe Jasinski, and uh, I work at uh, Nielsen. I work at Kubernetes and Python every day, and it's, it's great. Um, so uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a journey I took in the last year about how I learned Kubernetes. I was uh, really excited to hear about all this buzz around, what, around Kubernetes, and I really wanted to dig into it. So this is uh, how I went about doing that. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, a little history about um, how we um, came about, or how Kubernetes came to be. And I've been basically working with uh, developing web apps for you know over 10 years. And um, one of the things that comes to mind a lot when I'm trying to deploy stuff, one, one thing that really excites me is um, deploying code because you can build the best app you want, but then you know that when you push it to um, Push it to a staging environment or a production environment, it's going to break or it might break. You know, it's, it, something always seems to go wrong. So, in, around 2013, uh, this new technology, Docker, came out, which was pretty revolutionary. It let you package all of your operating system dependencies and Python packages and your code and configuration into a bundle that you can deploy uh, basically anywhere as long as it's Linux. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> any version. Any version of Linux, as long as it's a newer version. <laughs> um, so the whole idea is to make reproducible, isolated environments, and unlike virtual machines, Docker containers were very lightweight. They're very uh, um, so it wasn't as burdensome, uh, much more resource efficient. Now there's two main concepts to think about when you're dealing with Docker. There's Docker images and Docker containers. Images are the result of uh, building all, all of your applications into a single. Uh, into an image. That's where you bundle all of your code. And containers are running instances of your image. So you can have multiple uh, containers running on different infrastructure, different, different machines everywhere. So here's kind of a simple, here's a, an overview of the build process. You typically build a Docker container in something called a Docker file, which is, which is, which is just a script of steps to deploy, or to, to build, like app get install, or copy, various other things. You push that, um, Built image up to a Docker registry, such as uh, Docker Hub, and then you go onto your production machines and you, you check out the code. You do Docker run. We'll pull down the images and, and execute those images as containers. So um, you know it's great. You can, you'll have the exact same copy of the code, all of its resources needed wherever you deploy it. But um, how do you automate this? I mean, that's if you're actually going logging into different machines managing it, um, installing Docker and, and doing the Docker run, it just gets uh, tiresome. And um, how do we make that automated? What if we want to add a new uh, server to that mix? We have to spin that up manually and, and then run, run it there. What if we want to dynamically increase or decrease the size of your cluster? Let's say you get a spike of load and you want to be able to manage more traffic. Uh, do we, want, we don't want to go in manually have some log in in the middle of the night to do that. What if a failure happens? Um, you want to be able to address that and say, take that machine out of the, out of the cluster, take that machine out of, uh, and, and not get traffic there. So as a result, a few years later, um, Google came up with a project called Kubernetes, which uh, was, was designed to address these issues. You could um, automate your deployments. You could automate scaling and, and descaling. So um, it's what's called a container orchestrator. And Google was nice enough to open source this uh, around 2015. It basically makes your uh, your cluster of machines more resilient. You can automatically scale up and down uh, the number of uh, machines in your cluster. You can uh, basically abstract away the platform uh, from uh, like the infrastructure from your application. You can just say like, I want to deploy uh, I want to deploy this application or I want to deploy this application, and Kubernetes will take that information. And or take that, that specification and just deploy your application wherever it has room to. So it all comes down to a pod. Uh, a pod is the basic unit of, of Kubernetes. And you kind of think of a, a pod as a Docker container, but you can technically have more than one uh, Docker container inside of a pod. It's the thing that actually runs your application, but and pods are designed to be disposable, so you can destroy them and they'll, they'll come back up without effect, affecting your, um, your application. 
Pods exist on nodes. You run a pod on a node, um, you might have multiple nodes, and you can have multiple pods running on, um, on these nodes. You want to try to pack as many pods as you can on your nodes so you take advantage of the resources most effectively. And, and services uh, distribute traffic um, to your pods within the nodes. So, um, like if you have an application, in this case represented by this red, this red pod, um, you can um, route traffic uh, to whichever node you want, and it will Kubernetes will find where the pods are and um, make sure you get to that, that, or that make sure you get to that application. And let's say your um, let's say one of your nodes crashes, Kubernetes will um, properly route those pods, redistribute that traffic, so they go on to working nodes. Or if you want to scale up, um, you've got an additional node, uh, it can distribute it to pods across uh, the additional nodes. This doesn't happen all through magic. There's actually an additional, um, additional node that you use that, that orchestrates all of this activity, and that's called the master node or control plane. And there's a few services that run on this. There's like an API service, which, can, which um, is like the center, center of everything, a DNS service, an NTD service, with, which um, saves the state of the cluster, and a bunch of other things. Also, you don't want to store state inside of the cluster. Um, typically, you'd have your database or a shared file system that connects to your pods that exist outside the cluster that they can all write to and all have access to. So you can destroy a pod, it'll come back up, you'll still have the same data or the same files without, um, you know, without any problem. So deployments are a recipe for, uh, for deploying an application. Uh, it determines what Docker images you want to use, how many copies um, of the application you want to run throughout the cluster, what resources they need, and a, uh, a number of other things. So the point, deployments are kind of a center, like they define your app. So if you take a look again at this image here, uh, basically we're swapping out this red portion here where we're manually running all of the activity. We're swapping out with the Kubernetes cluster. So um, you have these pods when they spin up inside the cluster, um, they'll pull down the Docker images from the Docker registry and run as, as you'd expect. So when I started looking into Kubernetes about a year ago, I was wondering how I, how I should go about learning. What options are there to use Kubernetes? And what options are cheap enough for an individual to do as a hobby? And how flexible are they? Should I pull some old machines from my, my back room and try to like, mush them together into a cluster? So one thing I looked at is um, cloud services. Kubernetes has, um, like it's a very popular technology, so all the big players are starting to get involved with um, Kubernetes. Amazon, Azure, uh, DigitalOcean, they have um, pretty good services, but a lot of them are pretty expensive, especially for an individual. And a lot of these are pretty new. I mean, Kubernetes itself is a pretty new technology, but these are like brand new in terms of um, these services. The first the first um, cloud platform I looked at was Google Cloud Platform, or Google, Google Kubernetes Engine. And I like this a lot. They came up with Kubernetes, so they actually have a pretty good implementation of their, of their product. Um, and I found it to be pretty cheap, and it was pretty flexible, lots of features. Um, here's a nice comparison I found on a blog post uh, a few weeks ago, and you can get to the link uh, later. But it basically compares uh, Google, Amazon, and Azure, and Microsoft. And you can see on the left here, um, there's a lot going for Google. It kind of beats out a lot of them. And um, the pricing, I had a two-node cluster that, with about 1.7 gigabytes of RAM and an additional database server. And this is a, an adequate, adequate, adequate configuration for playing around with and run some work on it. It's not, not too bad. Uh, but it's $60 a month. And that's still kind of a lot, you know. Um, I couldn't run it on any smaller configuration. They were, they, it just wouldn't spin up with, with much less than that. So it's for a hobbyist, it might be great for an enterprise, but for a hobbyist, I, I was trying to look for other things. So one option of running Kubernetes outside of the cloud is using Minikube. Now, Minikube is the official development tool of Kubernetes. Um, but it runs on your local machine, and it runs with only um, like one one instance, it spins up a virtual machine inside of your physical, on your hardware, 
with a little cluster inside. It's got one node, and this is great for local development, but it's not really representative of, of a production cluster. You don't have like um, you know ten nodes that or a few nodes that you want to run on, and it doesn't really give you access to like installing or how we normally install or configure Kubernetes. So you know it, it didn't really. I wanted to do something more. So um, I got rid of it, but uh, that's where I went to look at Raspberry Pis. I had a bunch of these uh, laying around, and um, I wanted to explore what I could do with these. And uh, Raspberry Pis are thirty-five dollars each, so they're pretty cheap, and it, it really gives you a sense of ownership to have something you can hold in your hands and you can like practice installing the cluster and such. Raspberry Pis are four cores, the newest ones, 64 bits, 1.4 gigahertz, one gig, one gig RAM. So they're a pretty decent little machine for 35 bucks. What's what's the cost of that? 35 dollars. No, no, I mean you're. Oh, well, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, the, I'm getting to that next. Supplies. Um, I had to, um, you know, fetch the different materials I needed to put this together. Uh, the first of which is um, Raspberry Pis. I recommend having at least four, one for running a master node and three for work, running your worker nodes. Um, you need a case, I found a nice one here, uh, an ethernet switch to connect it together, a, uh, um, a Wi-Fi bridge, um, a USB power supply. Um, what's nice is that this powers everything here, including the switch, it all runs on five volts. Uh, some uh, USB cables, some flat short Ethernet cables, uh, some uh, like SD cards, and there's some optional supplies I got, um, like some heat sinks just to keep things cool, a little uh, USB flash drive so I could um, store like persistent data, and then a little Raspberry Pi sense hat <laughs> just to add some uh, some fun. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> I needed, since, you have a, since I have a Mac, I needed a, like a USB-C to get another back <laughs> <laughs> And uh, a little keyboard. This was kind of nice because it has a keyboard and mouse built in, so it was handy for doing debugging while I get it set up. So all of this costs um, about $343 for the core stuff and $160 for um, all those optional things. You could get it less than this if you want. I, this is priced out at five nodes. Um, you can get it a little bit cheaper if you do four or three. And so that's about $450, which equals out to Google Cloud Platform in about six or seven months. So um, that's where the cost crosses over. So uh, building a cluster, um, you know, after I got all the materials, I started putting it together. And at first I came up with something like this, and I couldn't help myself and I bought a few more nodes. <laughs> so uh, now this is what you, what you see here today with uh, one master node and five worker nodes, even though technically only four of them are enabled right now. I needed to set up a network, and this thing was nice, pretty handy for the cheap little thing that it is. Uh, it lets me connect to a Wi-Fi network, and then uh, it gives everything internet access. One thing that was pretty critical is I set up uh, static, static DHCP, so each of these machines, uh, based on our MAC address, will always get the same IP address. So um, it was really handy for configuring everything, because I can always guarantee that um, when it boots up, I'm gonna always get the same IP for each. I needed to choose an operating system. So um, there's a lot of different choices. Um, Ubuntu, Debian, uh, Raspbian. Uh, but I set up on one called um, Hyperot, Hyperot. And it's a uh, not based machine based on Debian. Uh, one of the things I really liked about it is, first of all, it comes with Docker pre-installed. And second, it uh, it's easy to, like, you can basically do a headless install. I don't have to have a keyboard or mouse to um, install and configure it. Basically, you need um, a, uh, <laughs> yeah, Mac again, you know. Basically, you need a um, flash drive that you can um, run this little tool that they have provided, uh, and it'll flash the drive, and you stick that drive into your, um, each node in the cluster, and it just boots up and works. It's great. So, um, Installing Kubernetes itself, once I actually have the nodes um, configured with an operating system, uh, I needed to, to um, I have a few goals in mind. One, I wanted to make it uh, pretty self-sufficient. I wanted to make it uh, automatable and reproducible, and I wanted to make it modular so I could install different components at, uh, and, you know, different components as I want. 
So there's a number of options to install Kubernetes. Chaos, KubeADM, KubeSpray, uh, or if you're on the cloud, you have a managed host that does it for you. And these, the first three here are, are good options. They're all actually official um, projects of the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, so they're pretty good. They all have their strengths and weaknesses. But KubeADM is the one I settled on. Um, and uh, I'm using, I use that to like get the cluster nodes to talk to each other, to register, register with each other. Ansible I use to, for all of the other stuff, like setting up, installing operating system dependencies, installing Kubernetes itself, uh, just everything else that I can fit, fit into KubeADM. And then Helm and Make I use for actually uh, deploying the different uh, applications for, for, uh, that I want to run on Kubernetes. Additionally, you need a command line tool called uh, KubeCuddle or KubeControl. Um, and this is the command line client, it's very robust, and um, this is where you install this on whatever um, machine you want to control the, uh, the cluster. Here's just a really small snippet of um, some Ansible scripts that I use to actually um, provision the machine, to like register Kubernetes cluster with each other. So I'm using the kubeadm init command. Basically, you run this kubeadm init, it, it generates a token for you that you then use on your, um, uh, on your nodes, to uh, register with a master and they can talk with each other and uh, start, start working together. So next let's, let's play around with the cluster a little bit. I'm gonna, this is where we go into it in the demo portion. Right, so let's lock it over. <laughs> Live demo. Live demo. So right now I'm inside the cluster. I'm on the master node, which is this one here. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, oh wait, I can't see you. Yeah. Oh, this, is, this is gonna be fun. <laughs> there. So uh, let me try to make this bigger. Can people kind of see that okay? Oh yeah. <laughs> Cluster. You can run this command, kubectl get node. And uh, this will show there's uh, one master node and uh, four worker nodes. And, and just, they're in the ready state, so they're, they're up and connected to each other. Actually, so are you, are you SSHing or it's just oh. physically connected with the USB cable? So or? right now I'm SSHing into, into this node. Okay. Yeah. This, um, the Mac is on the cluster network. I'm gonna to try to turn this so I don't have to like look behind me. <laughs> so then, if you want to take a look at the the pods that are running, do hook cuddle get po or pod? And this is uh, these are different um, uh, different pods that are running. I could take a look at one specifically. I can do hook cuddle. I can describe pod. Uh, a lot of the stuff I mentioned in the picture, but it's running multiple copies of it. 
Uh, but this is like the heart of Kubernetes. Um, so let's see what else do I want to show this down. Why is that? Oh, yeah. So, um, so one thing I can do is like run a little command. I can, I can actually run an application. Let's say I want to run a little web server. This is just a demo, but um, just an example. Um, so you can configure Kubernetes resources, oftentimes like with um, YAML files. So if you take, I've got a YAML file that I created called um, nginx deploy. And this just contains, um, like, you want everything in your Kubernetes cluster to be well-defined and reproducible. So using YAML, you can say, like, I want exactly this. And um, that way, if you need to rebuild your cluster, you have, um, you have like, the resource the configuration that you need to build it. So in this example here, I'm creating a service, and I'm creating a deployment object. I, I mentioned before, deployment uh, ties together some Docker images, images to um, the number of replicas that you want to run, and um, anything else that, like, it's like the recipe for deploying things. So I can run a command called kubectl apply dash f, and give it the name. And you can see it, um, uh, like, successfully created the Nginx deployment. So I don't know if you'll be able to see this very well, because unfortunately I can't scale the size of this uh, interface. But um, here we have uh, um, the Nginx deployment. Right now it's up and running for 20 seconds. This is called um, Kubernetes, this, this application. Nice little GUI tool for it. So I can do pedal, um, let's say I want to add more nodes. Let's say I want to make sure. Uh, make uh, you know a, a number of copies of it. I can do um, so. I, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to scale. I'm going to add four replicas uh, of the Kubernetes of the Nginx deployment. I spelled that right. Yep. So now, if we take a look at Kubernetes, um, so we have four copies of Nginx up and running, which is great. So, I mean, <laughs> and just to prove it to you, we can just. Uh, you just hit any node in the cluster. So this is 192.168.0.103, the IP address of this guy here. I can load that and then it exports. Or if I hit, um, like, let's say, um, 102, I hit it. I get the same thing. It doesn't matter what node I hit. It's going to take me to the same application. And it's going to. it doesn't matter what, what node the pod is running on. This is not the type of technical difficulties I expected with this talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alright. So, um, I can delete that deployment if I want. And I can do... Based 
tool for uh, interacting with Python, and it's, it's great. Everyone loves it, especially data scientists. So there's also another project called Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Hub, which like manages multiple users for um, for Jupyter Notebooks. So let's say you want to have like one server that runs like that, like manages ten, let, allows ten people to create their own isolated Jupyter Notebooks. And let's say you want to do that inside of a Docker container, so it's all like each person can have their own private operating system to run their notebook in, so they can install whatever um, tools they need. So there's this open source project called Jupyter Lab. Here's oops, Here's what it looks like. So it gives you the ability to start the server. And uh, let's see if I can make this a little bigger. Oh, big. <laughs> if I start this up, you can see here uh, it creates a, a um, creates a new container with my username in it, and it redirects me to um, a Jupyter oh, Jupyter notebook interface or Jupyter I can create a new terminal, and uh, you know, just to show you, it's an operating system. You name my <laughs> Yeah, it's Linux. Or um, if I want to uh, spin up a Jupyter notebook. Spin up a Python 3 notebook. Here we get to a familiar interface. One plus one equals two, it's working. And let's say I want to destroy it, like I'm done with my work, I'm going to shut it down, I can uh, stop my server. You'll see this turns into a terminating state here. It might be hard to see in the back, but this, uh, my notebook terminated. And then we're gone. It's a um, nice little bit. Uh, so, so let me talk about some drawbacks of using a Raspberry Pi cluster. <laughs> so. Building and deploying is really slow. Um, it's on an ARM architecture, which is um, not the most powerful. It, it's pretty decent, but it's building a Docker image on a Raspberry Pi is, is, uh, takes a long time. And pushing it to a Docker registry and pulling it takes a while. Um, everything needs to be built for ARM. And uh, it's <laughs> pretty fragile. I mean, uh, this weekend I tried to upgrade it, and I wiped the whole thing out. I had to install it from scratch. <laughs> and uh, but it's but what I learned I learned a lot I learned about I really wanted to get a sense of how all these pieces fit together how the hard how I could set up some hardware like given some physical machines how I could get Kubernetes running on it and that was pretty invaluable to me it gave me a chance to look at um, Kubernetes from top to bottom and also I had an opportunity to just learn how to debug a Kubernetes cluster which um, is, a, is a useful skill. So, and now I use it every day at work, so I'm really excited about that. Kubernetes at so, the cluster. Not this cluster. <laughs> a little bit. So I found some, um, there's a lot of resources on Kubernetes, but the documentation is really good. They have a nice cheat sheet you can use to um, uh, get familiar with some of the common commands. The, Reddit, the subreddit for Kubernetes is great. Um, there's always a lot of new technology, technology um, uh, that's within the Kubernetes ecosystem. And, um, so it's a really broad ecosystem. It's a really popular project on, on YouTube or on GitHub. And um, that's really my talk. If if you're if you have any questions or comments about it, I'm happy to um, talk with you individually or talk with after the talk. Also, I plan to go to the project night next week if and if there's interest. And I could, you know, if you want to learn about Kubernetes a little bit, I'll I'll play with this there and uh, have a good time with it. So, uh, any questions? Supported from ARM architecture, and I even I think there's a bunch of different network players that um, work with ARM now. But, uh, you know, 
know, there's, I found some good examples of it online, so it makes sense. Yeah? So if you had to go back and like rebuild this again, what would you have done differently? I would have, I would have bought, oh, the, the question is, if I were to do this again, what would I change? And I probably bought a lot of this equipment several times. Like I upgraded uh, the power supply, I upgraded the switch. So it was a little bit more than that number I gave. <laughs> but, um, like most projects. Yeah, but I found a good thing that works for me now. And, um, that was plus one thing. Uh, probably another thing is, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'd, I'd spend a little bit more time, like things I want to get be do better with this is make it a little bit more automated. Because though the, the, though the aspect scripts are pretty automated, there's still a lot of work I have to do to debug some of them because um, of things, problems. Yeah. Have you considered using like Mac Minis or even like those Intel Nucs? So yeah, Intel, I was looking for it. If there's a cheap x86 based um, you know, board that you use instead of the ARM architecture, like that would be awesome. Um, and maybe there is, I just haven't. Raspberry Pi is like, I don't think there's any that cheap. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, even for a little bit more expensive, I would consider it. It just makes deploying, um, see, with, with Docker on ARM, you basically have to rebuild every image from scratch. There's, <laughs> so if you want to deploy a common tool like, like Prometheus or even Jupyter Hub, you have to build this yourself. Like, the, the Docker community does provide um, some common Docker images for ARM, like uh, base images for Ubuntu and Nginx, or Nginx and Python, a whole bunch of them. But it's not going to provide you um, images for more esoteric uh, applications. So you're going to have to build those yourself. So it gives you some good experience like building things, but it's not very practical. Yeah. Did, you, did you take like the Jupyter Hub, like Ubuntu, and then just change the base image and attach the Docker Hub? That's kind of what I did. Um, for a lot of applications will install pretty well on, like this, on, on the ARM architecture. Like Python is pretty cross-platform, so if there's any Python dependencies you need, or even apps, they have builds for ARM and a lot of other uh, architectures, so it's not that bad. It's just having, not being able to use the community Docker images is, um, you know, disadvantageous. Yeah. So say if I have uh, different computers, like one Raspberry Pi, another one computer, uh, is, it, uh, is it possible to deploy a Linux cluster with different uh, architectures? So I believe you can run, or the question is, can you deploy Kubernetes on different architectures? Like we have a bunch of different machines at home you want to play with. Um, you can, I believe you can use Kubernetes on different machines as long as they're the same architecture. So if you're using x86, um, you, can, you only run it with x86 or ARM, you run it with ARM. There might be ways you could like cordon certain nodes for certain architectures, um, but I don't know. I haven't seen any use case for that. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I've looked for a long time on what I can do with this thing. The question is, what can you do this after? What, what, what can you do with it? <laughs> it was a great learning tool. Um, what I've been trying to do is get a nice little status. This, this blinky light thing on the top here. I wanted to, um, I wanted to um, tell him when the nodes are up and down, and it, it kind of does, but I need some to do more work on it. But that's not very practical. It's just telling you about the cluster itself. It's not. I mean, you could do anything you want with it. Like you could run a web server on it. You could run a database on it. I mean, why you use it? It's good for learning. <laughs> well, any, any last questions? One thing I can think of is if 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 you get a scheme of like. Number crunching a bunch of stuff. <coughs> you wouldn't actually do the number crunching on it per se, but you test out ideas you have. Yeah, it'd be good. He, uh, he was mentioning that this would be a good platform for prototyping. Sure. All right. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask me after the talks. Thanks a lot, Joe. That was amazing.